Hey ladies, welcome to the Whitaker Women Way. We are live again. I feel like it's been two weeks. It probably has been, maybe three weeks. I don't know. Time is just flying on by, isn't it? So welcome to our Wednesday live. It is June, so we are doing things a little bit differently. Um, Mondays and Fridays are pre-recorded and Wednesdays will be live. And then hopefully in July we can get back to doing all lives and eventually get back to doing five days a week because I really enjoyed being with you ladies every day during the week. It, it was encouraging to me. I hope it was to you as well. Um, but today is live and it's Wednesday, so it's the middle of the week. We're halfway there, right? All right. So today's scripture is going to kind of piggyback on Monday's passage um, where we talked about... Um, mm -hmm. You would think I could remember, but no, I can't. The exact wording here. All right, let's get to it. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So that was Monday scripture. So today's scripture kind of reflects that we're going to talk about self-control and love once again, right? 1 Peter 4, verses 7 and 8. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, some, since love covers a multitude of sins. I have a hard time reading my own handwriting sometimes. Since love covers a multitude of sins. So first off, we see here that Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. I think we feel that. I think the world feels that, right? I think our enemy feels that. He knows his time is short, and so he is pulling out all the stops to divide God's people, to really show the divide between the believers and the non-believers. The enemy is working overtime right now, and so that's why it's so important for us to be in the Word, to be in prayer, to be in fellowship with one another, to be studying His Word, to be doing devotionals together so we can learn the truth of what God says versus what the enemy wants us to believe. So the end of all things are at hand. We can agree that that is coming, but he can also be talking here that the end of me could be at hand, right? We don't know when our time is. And so I need to be for myself self-controlled and sober-minded, right? Because my end could be at any moment. Your loved one's end could be at any moment. Whoever you're praying for or you're seeking salvation for, their end could be at any moment. And so he's saying here, the end of all things is at hand. So all things makes me think of the world and what's happening, but I also think of those around us. Just not even all things in a general sense, but all things for you, all things for me could be coming to an end. And so we need to be diligent and staying on top of our study and our prayer. And he goes on to say, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Therefore, so because... The end of all things is at hand because the end of all things is coming. We need to be self-controlled, which we learned on Monday means restraint exercised over one's own impulses, emotions, or desires. So self-controlled, that we have control over our impulses, emotions, and desires, that we show others that Christ is our Lord. That we are can complete submission to him. When we have self-control over our emotions, our impulses, our actions, our words, whatever it is, when we have self-control in those areas, we are showing others that we are in submission to Jesus Christ. That our body, our feelings, our thoughts, our emotions, our speech, what's in our heart is in submission to Jesus Christ. So self-control is a great way to show the world what it is like to be a Christian, what it is like to be a believer, to fully follow Christ. Having self-control can show them that without us even having to tell them that we are believers. And so the end of all things, therefore, be self-controlled. So we'll be in control of our impulses, our emotions, our desires, and be sober-minded. Sober-minded, usually when you say the word sober, we go straight to um, drugs and alcohol, right? Like over addiction, we want to be sober-minded. And Peter could totally be talking about that here. 
that we need to not be um, drinking so much that we um, cannot think straight. We do not need to be doing um, drugs, whether legal or illegal, that we cannot think straight, that we cannot make good decisions, that we cannot be in control of ourself, of our impulses and our emotions. Sometimes people who are on prescribed medication, they have a loss of control of their emotions. They just can't handle it. You see people who lose control of their inhibitions on prescription medication that they need for maybe depression or some different situation for pain. They take it because they legitimately have pain, but it causes other issues, right? We see the long list of side effects. And so we need to be sober minded. I also think though, when we want to break down sober minded, if you need to be clear in the head, right? Your head needs to be clear. You need to be sober, able to think straight, rationally. That could be from the media. It could be from fear, from self-loathing, from hatred, from greed, from fleshly desires. All of these things can take over our mind, can make it to where we're more focused on ourselves, we're more focused on the world, what we want, than what God wants. So to me, sober-minded is more than just that drug and alcohol, to being sober from that and clear-headed from that, but from self-loathing. So many people are so obsessed with poor, pitiful me, that's all they think about. You're, you're more in love with yourself, even though you feel horrible for yourself, but that's all you think about is yourself, that you're not sober-minded enough to think about what God thinks about you, what God wants for this world what he wants for our loved ones, what he wants for salvation for them. So self-loathing, hatred, when we hate others, it can consume our thoughts. The media is driving this. And so if you're driven to be watching the news all the time or be on social media where you see all of this um, left against right, that's not what God wants for us. It's taking over our mind. We can't be sober-minded when we are constantly thinking about what does the left say? Well, what does the right say? And then it builds hatred in us towards um, another group of people. Guess what? God created those people too. Even though they don't think like us, it's okay. God still created them. He still loves them just like he loves you and me. Just because they don't look like us doesn't mean God doesn't love them. He loves them just the same. And so we can't have that hatred and be sober-minded. We can allow the media to cause fear in us. And we can't be sober minded because all we're thinking about is what's going to happen. Is somebody going to break into my home? Is somebody going to break into my car? Am I going to be attacked walking down the street? Is my business going to be burned down? Whatever it is, the media is instilling that fear in us that that's all we think about. And we're not thinking about eternity. We're thinking about the things of this world, those fleshly things that God has given us. But as we saw in Job, like we talked about, can be easily taken away as well. So, we focus more on the world than on eternity. And so I think Peter here saying be sober minded is reminding us that we need to be able to focus on God, focus on what Jesus did for us, focus on eternity more than focusing on ourselves and the things of this world. I think that's what he is meaning by the word be sober minded. So why stay self-controlled? Why stay sober minded? Why is he telling us to do this, I, and I think one, like we said before, is to show the world that Christ lives in us, that he is our Lord and our Savior and that we are in submission to him. I think by being able to do that, we, we, we are able to show the world things, being able to be sober-minded. We're able to then um, go out and tell others about eternity because we are more concerned with their salvation than what they think about us or what we think about them. We're more concerned with the fact that they have a final destination and it could be heaven or hell. And so we become more concerned with that when we're sober-minded. But Peter here is saying, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. It is so important to talk to God every day. The Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. But to also take time in a quiet place, whether you have a closet or a bedroom you can shut the door, or maybe your back porch, wherever it is, to just talk to God. When you're in self-control and you're sober-minded, you can focus on the things that really matter. Eternity. People's eternal salvation is at stake. Whether they're going to heaven or hell, it, it is on the line. And right now, we can see how the enemy is attacking, that he is trying to divide and conquer within the church. 
within our nation and around the world. We have to be sober-minded and in prayer about the things that matter rather than our selfish. If, if we're overwhelmed with fear or hatred or self-loathing and we're not sober-minded in these areas, then we're praying for selfish things. We're praying for things that go against God's will. We need to be sober-minded for the sake of our prayers, that we are praying in God's will, that we are praying for things that affect eternity. Are you even praying? Maybe you're so overwhelmed by these things that you don't even know what to say to God. You don't even know where to start. We need to get sober-minded. We need to be in control of our emotions. Sometimes our emotions get so overwhelming that, that we don't pray because we're just stuck in that cycle. Our desires, they become so, so more important to us than time with God, right? That, that's why he says be in self-control because our desires need to be of heaven, of eternity, rather than things of this world. And so if we're more focused on those selfish, fleshly desires, and we don't have control over them, then we're more drawn to those than spending time with God. So he's saying be self-controlled, be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Prayer can change so much. It can change so much inside of us as well, our heart. If you feel like hatred is a thing for you, you're feeling that hate towards another person, somebody who thinks differently than you or looks differently than you, whatever it may be that maybe has political views that are different than yours, you're feeling hatred towards those people, prayer can change that. It can take that away. It can show you them through the eyes of God. And you can love them the way God loves them. And then he goes on to say, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. So above all, like even, even more than the self-control and the sober-minded, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Now again, when we see in the Bible, love one another, we always want to go to like the non-believers, those who hate Christians, um, the ones, you know, we lump everyone together, but when we are reading the Gospels, when we're reading these letters, they're writing them to other believers. When Jesus was saying to love one another so they know that you are my followers, he was talking to the disciples. He's saying, love each other, right? Love your, your other disciple, my other disciple, I guess, uh, just as you would love yourself. And so Peter here, he's writing to um, the believers in Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, Bethyma. So he's writing to other believers. So he's saying, above all, love one another. He's saying, love your brothers and sisters. Again, this is showing Christ to the world because as Christians, we've done a really crappy job in showing that we can love one another. We put down other denominations. We put down um, people who leave our church. Maybe we don't like the reason why they left, and so we don't love them anymore, right? You see this all the time. There's so much hatred between believers that we're not showing Christ to the world. He's saying love one another. This shows the world that we are followers of Christ. That's what Jesus said. We did a study on that a couple weeks ago. You can go back and find that one. I don't remember the verse. Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's going to be one of those. Um, but he's saying love one another. Above all, love one another. And he says earnestly. To love them earnestly. Earnestly means with a sincere and intense conviction. And this makes me want to go back to the loving those who are not believers. We need to love one another as Christians. But we also need to love the non-believer because God loves them as well. If we have a conviction that they have damnation coming to them, that they are going to burn in a lake of fire for all eternity, if we have that sincere and intense conviction, what earnestly means that these people are going to die and burn in hell forever, be tortured and tormented forever, then we would have a love for them to tell them the truth, to tell them where they're going, and to tell them what Jesus did for them, and that they have the opportunity to accept him, to accept his forgiveness, that, that he paid for their sins, and they just have to accept it, and, and to believe on him. 
And they too can be in eternity in heaven forever with us. That's the kind of love we're supposed to have for one another. So he's saying above all, love. Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And the love here, just like in Monday's verse, this love um, in 1 Peter 4 is the agape love, the love that God has for us, an unconditional love. And um, I shared this quote from Christianity Today um, as they're trying to explain agape love. It says, a pure, willful, sacrificial love that intentionally desires another's highest good. So, a lo since love covers a multitude of sins, since this unconditional love covers a multitude of sins, we like to make love conditional. If you do something wrong to me, if you sin against me, I'm not going to love you, right? We hold our love back from people. But that's not what God does with us. We sin against him every day. We go against his word. We go against what he wants for our lives. We, we take a step in, in the opposite direction than where he wants us to go. We sin against God daily, and yet he still loves us. He still pursues us. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to have for one another as believers and for the non-believers, that they may sin against us. It happens. We're all human. Christians screw up. We're going to hurt one another's feelings. We're going to do each other wrong. It's going to happen. But we have to have that unconditional love for each other where it says, you know what, this love I have for you because of what God did for me, his love for me, I can show this love to you even though you did me wrong, even though you sinned against me, I can still love you as my brother and sister in Christ. We have to show that love to others. It's going to show the world what it's like to be a Christian, that they, they should want that as well. Look at what Jesus did. Dying on the cross. His love covered not just a multitude of sin. It covered every sin. Past, present, and future for every person who's ever lived on this earth. God just wants us to come to him. And he wants us as believers to share this with others. That they can know that their sins, every single one of them, has been covered with the love of Jesus Christ. We can reflect that to others. It's good news that they need to hear, especially these days, because if time is drawing near, just as Peter started off the verse, if the things are all coming to an end, people need to hear this because the enemy is attacking and telling them differently. But we have the opportunity to show them with our actions and to tell them that someone loves them more than any wrong they've ever done. And no matter what they continue to do, they're still going to be loved. They just have to believe in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much for your son, for the sacrifice he made on the cross, Lord. That the blood that was shed didn't just cover our sins, but it washed them away that we have come to you and we've asked for forgiveness of those sins, Lord, and you've even forgotten them. That the enemy cannot use them against us any longer, Lord. That's the good news that people need to hear, Lord. Help us to spread your word. Give us the strength and the courage to speak the truth to those who do not yet know you. Help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, even the ones who have done us wrong, Lord. Help us to show them the unconditional love that you have showed us, that you show us every day, Lord. God, you are so good to us. We just thank you and we love you. Help us to be in control of ourselves. Show us how we, we may be flooding our mind with things that keep us from focusing on you and on eternity, Lord. Help us to be sober-minded. Draw us into a place of, of deep prayer where we want to be with you every day, Lord, just talking to you. We thank you, God, for who you are for all you've done for us and what you're going to do for us, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, ladies. Well, that was a wonderful live. I'm Like again, I said, I like doing the lives better, but 
we do what we can till we get caught up on work. So I will see you back here live next Wednesday, but don't worry, there'll be a video on Friday and on Monday, and I'll see you on Wednesday, and there'll be another video on Friday, and then we'll just keep doing it over and over and over again. All right, have a wonderful week, ladies. I'll see you later. Bye.